welcome back, ladies and gents. Um, guys, I'd like to start by giving you another uh, opportunity to ask some questions because I know there was still some more at the end of last session. So if anybody has a question they want to ask, now is a good time to do it. I see a, I see a hand. I see a couple of hands, actually. Thank you for your um, lovely presentation, by the way. So, Thank you. Uh, my question goes back to uh, the comment you made about uh, the equality and the power dynamic. Mm. You mentioned that. Um, so a lot of us in the red pill believe that um, it's and a lot of statistics and studies have backed up that when the man holds more power in that dynamic, it actually results in a healthier relationship mm -hmm. for, for, for both partners. Is that mm -hmm. something you would agree or disagree with? Uh, should a man hold more power in a long-term relationship? I mean, I'm single. I don't have any kids, so I'm not really like the best person to ask about long-term relationships because I don't give a fuck about them. <laughs> <laughs> I think, um, I think people should do whatever they want. I did speak to a lady yesterday. I've spoken to three uh, girls in the last 24 hours. Told them about this convention. Told them what I'm doing. And their response wasn't neutral. It was, to paraphrase Mr. Johnson, fuck yeah. All three of these girls, one's raised Eastern Orthodox. She's Serbian. One's in Malaysia. She's Malay. She's Muslim. And the other girl is from Romania. And I, they were like, well, what are you talking about? What is this thing? And I said, well, this is it. This is what these guys believe. These are some of their ideas. And... They were like giving me responses and I was laughing and I was going, I think your responses is what these guys call Tradcon. And now not the, the, these girls, the Muslim girl lives in a Muslim country, Malaysia. I mean, it's, it's, there is no separation of church and state. That is a Muslim country for Muslims. And if you don't like it, <laughs> off you go. I lived there for three years. Um, and she says, she's, she's smart girl. She's got a degree in psychology. She's educated in the UK. She says she's under so much pressure there to be a wealthy entrepreneur at age 27. And all she wants to do is get married and have kids. And she feels like that's become a, a thought crime in Malaysia, in a Muslim, a devoutly, rigidly nationalistic and Muslim country. She is a 27 year old Muslim girl. So she's, she's late to get married. She says, nobody's pressuring me towards that, but everybody's pressuring me to make money. So I had a similar conversation with the, with the Romanian girl. Her situation is a little bit different. The Serbian girl said what you just said, which is, and that, that, this girl, like, she flipped on me. I wasn't expecting this at all. She said, in a long-term relationship, I believe the man should have more power. And I'm like, okay. And she said, what do you think? And I'm like, Pfft. you know, so I was like, what, you know, answering as a psychologist, I think what I've observed is that there are, there's like uh, culture bound expectations. Um, but also we know from the research that when the man, there is a, a correlation between if the man is older, more experienced and higher status, then the relationship has more sustainability. What I've observed in my private life is when you have two people who are exactly the same age and the woman is earning more than the man and has more status and more power than the man. I know I'm they're in my extended family, both couples. The guys are happy but silly and boyish in their 50s and the women are miserable. They're bitter as fuck. Do I assume from these observations that then if a woman is in a long-term relationship with a man, she needs to feel that he's more powerful than her? Yes, I observe that. Do I have scientific evidence that proves it conclusively? No. Um, I was a big follower of, uh, I still am, of Patrice O'Neill. He was a stand-up comic. He sadly uh, passed away years ago now. And he made the point, a semi-scientific point, that in the mammalian world, where there is a big weight disparity between the sexes, um, that we can track that uh, men, uh, sorry, males and females are polyamorous, for example. So if if, if um, amongst, say, dogs, male dogs are bigger than female dogs, or there's a disparity, then you're polyamorous. So I was like, well, that would suggest then that there must be a biological root for certain preferences and behaviors. We are bigger than women. So we are fall into that category of mammals where between the sexes, there's a size difference. There's a size difference. I immediately, in order to be a man, I'm bigger than the woman. 
So then it, is it, it within her hardwired, non-cultural, instinctive drive to experience me as being bigger than her, more powerful than her in every area of life? Possibly. Humans aren't that complex. I mean, we're pretty, in terms of symbolism, we're quite crude. Like, if you're bigger than me here, then you should be bigger than me there. If you're, like, the, the, the reverse, right? You get guys who don't want to get with women who are making more money than them because huh, you should be smaller than me physically and maybe financially as well. So um, my observation to answer your question in a more concise way would be it seems to be the case that that is what women want. Um, makes sense to me. There was another hand that went, yeah. Uh, hey, Richard. Hi. I'm trying to switch from mindset of scarcity to mindset of abundance. I'm, right now in my work environment, it's a very, uh, it's, it comes from mindset of scarcity. There's a lot of time pressure. It doesn't have long longevity. And it's basically a zero sum game. For me to win, to make money, I have to beat somebody uh, mentally, not physically. And life doesn't work like this. I think that life is abundant. For you to succeed, you can succeed while helping other people and they'll like pay, pay you for that, basically, what I'm looking to dip in my feet into. But somehow, as I'm trying to get from this scarce environment to the abundant, I don't know how to get there because I have these mental models from the scarce world and I can't apply them into the abundant world to succeed. You're conflating mindset with environment. Um, so you said you're looking for an, an abundant mindset, but that your environment is scarcity. Mindset can be divorced from the environment. Um, it's hard, it's a discipline, and it would take very, very strong internal boundaries. But if you're in an environment that's telling you there's not enough, there's not enough, for you psychologically to say there's more than enough for everybody would take a lot of strength and good boundaries. You'd need strong internal boundaries and strong external boundaries. So anytime you get a message of scarcity, you'd have to be able to unconsciously reject it without ever thinking about it. But don't conflate the internal with the external and uh, a mindset with an actual environment. At your age, um, it will be very hard for you to fight the environment and the culture and the tribal norms because at your age, you're supposed to be following them. So if you're in a tribe where everybody's like, the scarcity, the scarcity, every impulse in you will be to do what they're saying. So part of your maturation process, if you set that intent, you'd be like, no matter how scarce the environment is, I'm gonna maintain an abundance mindset. It would serve you very well. But we will be talking in like five to 10 year sort of uh, phasing for that. Does that make sense? Hello, you Hello. Uh, mentioned uh, people dealing with abandonment issues. Yeah. And if you are and you're trying to solve that puzzle box, can that be something that you'll reasonably expect to be solving the rest of your life? Or is there some method of self-soothing or autonomy that can overcome that? Um, the, well, with this particular course, uh, that you guys will get access to what, once we've shot it and edited it and I've had it. I'm going to put other courses of mine in this that would help. So I have a course to help people stop emotional flashbacks that you'll get. I mean, you guys will get this for free. You'll get all of it for free. Um, but I'll also give you access to a course that helps you to develop emotional literacy. If you're not flashbacking and you're emotionally literate, it's unlikely that you'll be at the mercy of strong uh, feelings of abandonment that are just emotional flashbacks. They're not based on anything real. You brought up self-soothing. One of the things I hypothesize that having a strong, present male role model in your childhood uh, equips you with is a couple of pieces of source code in the software. One is the sense that no matter what, everything is gonna be okay. And no matter what, I'll be able to handle it. I think that's what your father is supposed to give you, a sense that everything is gonna be okay, like a baseline of a sturdy, stoic optimism, and the sense that no matter what happens, I will be able to handle it. 
these things, um, you mentioned abandonment anxiety, but I actually think that those two pieces of source code help a lot with abandonment anxiety. No matter what happens, I'm able to handle it. Yeah, it's on my own, then I can handle it on my own and uh, everything is gonna work out okay. So the, um, the way, the methodology for handling it, I think would be through developing emotional literacy a little bit more, which is not always pleasant and it takes time. Like there's a course I can give you guys to do. It, it really, really helps. It massively helps, but it's not, it's not a joy ride. It can be a bit heavy sometimes. Was there another hand that went up? Somebody at the back? Do you know at the back have your hand up? No? No? Cool. Um, so one of the things I wanted to, to raise with you um, at the beginning of this section is trying to answer the question, how should men protect themselves from toxic relationships now? You can't really answer that question without looking at where we're up to culturally and historically. Again, I'm a newcomer to uh, the uh, man manosphere and red pill psychology or philosophy rather. So if I'm repeating anything, I apologize. From my perspective, um, speaking uh, psychologically, what I can see is that we're stuck between different modalities, between um, chivalry and this idea of equality. You raised equality before, sir. Just, just to be clear, when I say equality, I obviously don't mean literal equality. Nothing outside of mathematics and physics is equal. These are concepts from mathematics. Only numbers are equal. As a philosophical concept that we can aspire to, probably we'd be better off using the word fair. Nobody really wants equal. Like, nobody wants it. Equal would be so fucking weird. We'd all look exactly the same. Uh, identical twins, I guess, are equal in that sense. What we want is justice, and what we want is fairness, and we've got this awkwardly implanted idea from mathematics and physics which is equal so that concept i actually think whilst it was well intentioned has become toxic because we're now striving for something that is totally unnatural and totally unattainable you cannot attain equality in the same way that you can't attain total justice it's it, it's a concept to be moved towards so we're stuck between a toxic idea of equality that basically wants to smash everything down and make everything horizontal, which sounds horrifying to me, and chivalry. Chivalry also has toxic elements to it because I personally believe... Now available exclusively at 21 University. The all-new CPTSD Masterclass by Richard Granin. This is the world's most advanced educational course on healing from complex trauma as a man. Learn more at the link below or visit 21university.com.